It's great to have you here, everyone. It's great to be here. We were here earlier, although we didn't see any of you yet. And then we whisked off to Kamoka to be with them for a little while. And now we're back with, uh, with a, a new, even better looking group of people. Don't you think, guys? Yep. Yeah, uh, this mic's not on. Um, okay. it's, um, uh, it's a good deal for not just uh, for us to be able to be with you, three different con- you know, congregations or groups of people today, but it's a good deal for you. You get like three in one, you know? I didn't mean that like a trinity or anything. I just meant like no, no. three, four, one, I should say, you know? It's like a really good deal, you know? So you got your money's worth for your tithes and offerings this morning. And, uh, Is it like three times as long? Uh, maybe, yeah, it could be if you want. Um, At this rate, uh, the rea- the rea- the reality is though. Sometimes you know when you get a good deal on something, and then you discover that the three things you thought you got for you know the price of one are actually worth only one third of what you thought they were. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we're hoping that's not the case here this morning. <laughs> Uh, we'll see, right? Uh, last Sunday on the uh, the final week of our spiritual life series, we talked about living a life of love. And uh, that was a really good ending to that series. Of course, Valentine's Day was just on Friday. And uh, as you were already reminded today, and uh, uh, so guys, did you do okay or did you strike out? Uh, You know, if, uh, of course, you have family day tomorrow. Uh, In the interest of us focusing on families, not only this past week, but also uh, tomorrow and and this week, uh, we're going to begin this morning by telling you a bit of a, a family love story. All right, we got a got a picture we want to show you of a couple named George and Mabel. And, uh, and, and they lived a long time ago in, uh, in Gull Lake, Alberta. So this is a, a family that, that lived out in Alberta. It was early winter, and part of the lake had frozen over. So George asked Mabel if she would walk across the frozen part of the lake to the general store and get him some smokes and beer. And uh, so she asked him for some money, but he said to her, just put it on our tab, old Henry won't mind. So Mabel, being the loving wife that she was, she walked across the ice, she picked up the, uh, the smokes and beer at the store, and she walked back home across the ice again. And when she got home, she said, George, you always tell me not to run up the tab at, 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 at Henry's store, so why didn't you just give me money? And George said, well, Mabel, I didn't want to send you out there with all that cash when I wasn't sure how thick the ice was. <clears throat> so That's a Tim joke. No, no. <laughs> yes. Somebody at Gateway yes. sent me that this past week. I just want you to know. But uh, so the reality is that uh, if even if you struck out on Valentine's Day, guys, you're not as bad as George. Okay, and so you can redeem yourself. <laughs> Gas stations are open tomorrow. And yes. Sometimes they have good. leftover. Yeah, leftover know, flowers. Yeah, in a flowers. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Never too late. Once in a while, we have a segment that we call God's Two Cents, in which we look at a, a particular issue. And we ask what God thinks about it. We really believe that God's word and what God speaks into our lives, that, that that's how we're to live our lives, that God wants to, uh, to use his scriptures to bring them alive for us. And they're useful for training us, sometimes for correcting us mm. when we choose bad jokes. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's through God's word that, um, and, and through these times that we have together, that uh, we really want to bring what God thinks about certain things yeah. uh, to the plate. Yeah, so today we're going to look at the state of the family in Canada. And this is the first of almost a two-parter. Uh, next week we're actually going to look at living the spiritual life within the confines of family. And so uh, today we're going to look at the state of family in Canada and what implications that has for us. Uh, and for our lives, and we're going to listen to what God actually has to say about the family and how we apply that to our lives. And so, uh, and so the question, I guess, that we need to start with is, what is the state of the family in Canada today? It's interesting, as, as we were looking at some of the, uh, the current statistics, uh, the, the picture of what Canadian families are, are actually looking like in the world that we're living in right now. There are about 13 million households in Canada. And of those 13 million, 9 million of those are family households. 30 years ago, 83% of families were married couples with children. Today, only 68% of families are. There's a a steady decreasing trend with that. The number of one-parent families is increasing steadily, as well as the number of people living common law. 
And in many cases, one of the adults isn't a parent of the children that are in the home. Today, the average number of children per family is barely over one. We need 1.7 just to stay um, uh, in order to sustain our, our population. 26% of families in Canada have no children. Most of Canadian, uh, Canada's population growth is due to our immigration. So from birth rates, rates alone, we're not even replacing ourselves for the future generation. And mm -hmm. so Canada would be in a steady decline if it weren't for our immigration. Mm -hmm. There are just over uh, 400,000 victims of violent crimes in Canada each year. And one quarter of them are victimized by a family member. The vast majority of child abuse cases occur in single parent homes, where in most cases the father is not present. The most common abuser of children are single mothers, followed by live-in boyfriends or stepfathers. In fact, children are 33 times more likely to be abused when a live-in boyfriend or stepfather is present than, a than in a completely intact family where the father is present. There is a strong correlation between adolescent trouble, delinquency, runaways, homelessness, suicide, uh, crime, incarceration, and the breakdown of the traditional family unit characterized by dysfunction, neglect, abuse, parental absence, especially among fathers. The absence of the father is a more reliable predictor of criminal activity than race, environment, or poverty. In fact, um, it, it's, a, it's like an epidemic type thing when it comes to those who are experiencing that. Um, in fact, father-deprived children account for 72% of all teenage murderers, 70% of incarcerated youth, 75% of teen suicides, 80% of the adolescents in psychiatric hospitals, and 90% of runaways. Children who are deprived of father are nine times more likely to drop out of school, 10 times more likely to abuse substances, 11 times more likely to be violent, and eight times more likely to go to prison. If you have experienced fatherlessness, but you are not one of these statistics, thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's his grace. Thank God. In the media, especially movies and television, the depiction of the family is supposed to be a representation of society. And I would propose that it not only does reflect societal trends, but it also influences and shapes societal trends. For example, have you noticed that almost every family sitcom depicts a mother who is intelligent, motivated, strong, organized, quick-witted, and exceptional at parenting, while the father is a dull, lazy, weak-willed, disorganized moron who hasn't the slightest clue about parenting or anything else for that matter, if he's there at all. Have you noticed that? So I would propose that not only reflects societal trends, but it also helps to shape them, unfortunately. Today, the prevailing trend seems to be that the concept and depiction of family more emphasizes the individuals in that family with their preferences, desires, needs, and dislikes, rather than the family unit in which individuals are actually secondary to the overall family as a whole. All that, I think, begs us to, to ask a couple really important questions. First, um, where will this lead us over the next 10, 20, 50 years? What will Canadian society look like in the future? When you heard these statistics this morning, when you heard these facts about the family in Canada, what did you think? How did it make you feel? And I guess, what are the implications for our lives? Yeah, the reality is that um, many of you are here today, you heard these, and um, you realize very quickly, uh, you know, the, the stark reality of how they have related to you, and others, not so much. But here's, here's the point. We've all been touched in some way by the state of the family in Canada. They do, these things we talked about do have implications for our lives. 
I don't know which statistic may have pierced your heart or created a lump in your throat or brought a tear to your eyes or caused anger to flash inside of you. I don't know what your families are all like. I don't know what you have personally experienced. But it is not a stretch to say that all of us are affected by the state of family, whether good or bad, and that our outlook, our perspective, our view of the world today has been and is being shaped by home and by family realities, both in the past as well as in the present. So we're just going to take a moment and tell you uh, basically our own family stories. Dave. Well, and, and that's so true. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, and, and my dad and mom were, uh, were Christians. We were a Christian family. Uh, both dad and mom went to Bible school. That's where they met, fell in love, and got married. And, and they were always involved in leadership in church. So as, as a child growing up, Church was everything to us, and, and mom and dad were very involved in every aspect of church life and giving leadership even. So on the surface, everything was normal and healthy in the Andrews home. I grew up believing that my family was a normal family, in fact a family that every family should be like. And, and that's just the way I, was, I, I grew up with that perception. There were, there were no red flags. There was nothing going on that to me said this is wrong. And, and, and yet, at the age of 19, after my parents being married for 31 years, they announced that they were getting a divorce. And it shocked me because I thought everything was, was healthy. Years later, Mom disclosed to us that she had been molested as a little girl by her father for most of her growing up years. And that painful secret she had kept to herself until she was in her 70s. And it was through the, the hurt and through the, the things that weren't taken to the Lord for healing and, and, and all of those things. Mom just keeping that such a secret. But it really shaped her ability to relate intimately and personally with Dad. And so for their married life, Dad could never understand why Mom was relationally and physically so distant with him. And finally, Dad fell into sin, and, and, um, and then the divorce happened. I realized when our family crumbled, looking back, that everything that I had watched, everything that I had been formed by and shaped by to say, this is normal, this is how you'd, you're our dad, this is how you're a husband, this is what family is. I had huge gaps, and it wasn't until I was married and some of those gaps started showing that I, uh, God really took me on a learning curve, yeah. and, and it's awesome what he can do, no matter what we come from, yeah. to fill in those gaps. Yeah. I've often described my family as the type of family you would see on the TV show Cops. You know when the police are called in to like this domestic disturbance and they show up at the house and it's like absolute chaos and one person's like freaking out on the others and they're all just like, he rather. That was my family growing up. Um, I, am, I am the middle child of three. Uh, I have two sisters. Um, the most honest way to describe my home is a place that lacked peace of any kind. Uh, my father is an alcoholic. Uh, there are very few childhood memories that I have that are not shaped or influenced by the effects of alcohol. I've been awoken at 3 a.m. by the police at the door. Uh, I've had to help my father up off the bathroom floor because he's too drunk to stand and he's already wet himself. I've experienced moments like this. I have, my mom is a hard worker who's been beaten down by life for so many years. I have two sisters. Both were pregnant before 18. One of them was a grandmother at 35. There was no faith in my family. 
But the local church, so we moved around a lot, the local church has always offered Sunday school, and my parents were always willing to send us. And now, now I know more about what a family is. I find it ironic because I actually ran to God from my family. Hmm. My situation was sort of the opposite. And uh, I am the oldest of five children in my family. My parents were committed, consistent Christians who really lived what they believed. And my dad was a pastor for almost 40 years and his father for 50 years. So I experienced the legacy uh, of generations of godly people who are dedicated to family and ministry. And um, thankfully, my kids are now experiencing even another generation of that. But my mom, I would call her a selfless, giving, godly woman who really prays and who really displays the character of Christ. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. It would be easy to think then, when you look at my family, that everything you know, would always be great. But we came through some stuff. We came through some rocky times. I, I had uh, one of my siblings early on in marriage experience their spouse drifting in faith and growing cold in love, compromising in integrity and becoming unfaithful maritally, refusing to repent and reconcile, leaving uh, the sibling, my sibling, with two kids, who to this day, those kids experience the fallout of that in many ways. Another of my siblings got messed up in drugs and vandalism and other deviant behavior, had a child out of wedlock, broke up with a partner. Now the child lives with the other parent in a single parent family. And to this day, my sibling is not really in right relationship with God. Another of my siblings moved away from the family, secretly due to feelings of resentment towards us until it all came pouring out in a series of dishonoring letters to my parents, which cut them and, and broke their hearts. I'm thankful to say, though, that some of these things have been turned around and they've been resolved, and that God has brought healing and restoration uh, to my family. I love my family, I love my siblings, and I thank God for every one of them. We've experienced a lot of questions about why things happen, but we've also experienced the grace of God in so many ways. And we wanna tell you a little bit too about what we have seen as pastors uh, about families and, and for families, especially here at Gateway. You know, there's no question that uh, just attending church or being a Christian. It doesn't mean that you have a healthy, happy family. There are no guarantees. As a pastor, my heart breaks uh, for those families who find themselves in painful, hurtful, damaging situations. The good news, and, and literally the good news that God offers, is that God cares about the very details of our lives. He cares about our families, about our marriages. And I have seen miracles of healing of relationships and rest restoration of families by the power of God. When God is invited into situations where there's been such hopelessness and, and fear and discouragement and anger and, and brokenness, where those things have ruled, but when God is invited in, and it's not just an overnight change, but I have seen literal miracles happen where there's, there's a transforming of, of hearts turned toward one another again, where, where there's been such anger and all of a sudden there's a, a love that, that goes beyond what words could ever explain. I really believe that um, with God's help, there is no situation that's beyond what God can't be invited into to bring life and light. Yeah. Wayne, your perspective as student ministries director here would be from a different perspective than, than what I see. Yeah, the majority of like my reflections on the, the family relationship would be more you know, student to parent and parent to student sure. than it would be necessarily uh, marital. Um, I'm all too familiar with the my parents just don't understand. Uh, I see students striving constantly to, to gain some sort of attention or approval from mom or dad. You know, maybe if I, maybe if I just pass you know, this course or maybe if I just study hard enough or if, if you know, I make that sports team or if I can just, if I can just, if I can just. And you see the weight of the expectations of parents that can really bring, uh, bring students down. I also see the hypocrisy a little bit, or the perceived hypocrisy. Yeah. You think my mom is great, but here's the things you don't know about my family. 
And for those of you in your seats that are a little uncomfortable, I'm not naming names or anything like that, but uh, just, just kidding, bringing a little light. But I have a daughter in junior high, so I'm yeah. thankful. <laughs> Don't say Let anything. Go. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, but the truth is that I see all of that from the students' perspectives. <clears throat> and, um, and I know that parents aren't always wrong, but uh, what, I, what I really see, I see over strict parents, over protective parents, disengaged parents, parents who focus on the wrong things in their student lives. But the most important is I see the lack of communication between a parent and, and students. The, this breakdown of communication is exactly why we see such a horrible breakdown in the relationships between mm -hmm. parents and students. Yeah. Because the truth is that I can tell you that a student who experiences love, encouragement, and support from their parents has no limit to what they can accomplish. Hmm. When a student is loved and cared for, they develop a strong sense of confidence and willingness to try new things. And, and they often succeed in them. And, I, and I'll typically relay that to similar to riding a bike. If, if you ride a bike and as a, as a child you fall off that bike, but you have a mom or a dad who help you get back up on that bike, you are not only more likely to try again, you're much more likely to, to actually be good at it mm. and to keep going and to try new things and to keep you know, developing those yeah. skills. As a pastor, I have, um, I've met with a lot of people over the years uh, in different family situations, different marriage situations, and I've talked to people who strongly dislike their families we use that term because, you know, you're not supposed to hate anybody when you're a Christian, you know. But uh, they dread getting together with them or they've experienced horrifically dysfunctional family situations. I've met with people who are deciding to break their marriage vows. They've already made up their mind. And many, many times, in fact, 100% of the time, they don't fully understand how the enemy of their soul has been allowed in, in some way, to steal, kill, and destroy to do his work. And they have no, they really don't have the concept about the multiple ways that this will ultimately acutely affect their family and their children for the rest of their lives. Those of you who have experienced this kind of a thing, you would be the greatest supporter of that fact that it would uh, acutely affect uh, your, your family. I've sat with people who say they love God, they love their church, they love their pastors, but they can't stand their spouse. And they've been deceived into believing that these realities can simultaneously coexist in a committed Christian which is not the case. I've also seen that, that people who have come from very difficult family situations and backgrounds and through very difficult situations, either in a marriage or a family, but guess what? They have experienced the love, the grace, the healing, the joy, and the wholeness that comes through the transforming, transforming power of the Spirit of God, and guess what else? Through the family of God. What a great thing we have here called the family of God. We desperately need the family of God. When I think this morning, uh, you may be here, and um, your family is, is perhaps, um, <clears throat> you're separated from them through one thing or another. Perhaps you're single. Perhaps there's been such uh, estrangement, or, or you've experienced such difficult situations in your family and, um, and, and with your natural family that it's hard to even hear the word family without mm -hmm. something inside you just sort of nodding up. But Pastor Tim, you're, you're right. We're a part of God's family. Yeah. And, and that's something that is completely supernaturally put in place because God cares about each one of us. Mm -hmm. And regardless of where we find ourselves, regardless of our situation, that in this place, and not this physical building, more than just an hour on Sundays. But, but God wants us to be a spiritual family. He wants us to learn how yeah. to... Yeah, I stole your line. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but well, he, he wants us to be family together. He wants us to receive from one another, yeah. but he wants us to give to one another as only a family can. And so if you're here this morning and you're feeling like you could be on the outside looking in, Please know from God's heart, you're a part of the family. Yeah, that's good. And so we're left to ask, what does God say? Mm. That's the purpose, right? God's two cents. We're here to get his opinion. What does God say? What does he think about family? What is, what is his thoughts on this idea? 
Well, let's look. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? That, so, that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. This verse tells me that no matter what background we come from, the truth is that we can be washed, cleansed, and transformed. That God has the power to change no matter what circumstances you're coming from, no matter what your family background, God can change you and transform and wash you. Mm. And you don't have to reflect the trends of society because you can be changed and be different. Uh, Joshua 24, 15 says, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And, I, and to me, when I read this scripture, I, I picture this idea of a family pursuing God together. The, the family is a place where you should be free to explore and to nurture and grow in your faith. Yep. And you should be encouraged in that. And, and I love the idea of serving God and developing your faith not as individuals, but as a family. Mm. And together you learn more about God and you learn to walk in his ways more. First Timothy 5 says, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. And when I think of the family, I picture a newborn baby being born into that family. You think of how frail and how weak they are. And it is the family's responsibility to provide for that child, to look after their physical needs, look after their emotional needs, look after their spiritual needs. And I believe that that is our responsibility as a family and also as a family of God, is like the picture of that baby just needing so much and us being able to pour into them. That's exactly what I believe God is calling yeah. us to. And then many years later. And then many years the later, reverses. the role reverses. And then you're pouring it. Yeah. We, we care for those who are elderly and need it. Mm -hmm. And then Galatians 6 just says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers, which is just another emphasis on the view of, of us as a family of God. Mm -hmm. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, You are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You see, we may live in Canada. We may be affected by the state of the family in Canada today. But God has called us. He's called every one of you out of darkness into his light. He has chosen us. He's made us holy. And he has brought us into his family so that we may declare his praises. God declares today that you belong to him. And there's something powerful about that that supersedes any of our individual families. Hebrews chapter two says, both the one who makes people holy, that is Jesus, and those who are made holy, that is you, are of the same family. Did you know that Jesus is part of your family today? Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, it says. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly I will sing your praises, which is from Psalm 22. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. That's from Isaiah 8. So hundreds of years before, centuries before now, you were, in, uh, uh, you were included in the prophecies that were inspired by, the, by God himself and by his spirit to declare his word prophetically about you being together with Jesus in God's family. In Romans chapter 8, it says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption as children. And by Him we cry, Abba, or Daddy, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we are children, then we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if we indeed share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. Friends, the Holy Spirit who dwells in you today testifies with your spirits that you and I are children of God Himself. We are part of the same family. You know, right from the very beginning, when God said, let us make man in our image, male and female, he created them. The identity of family 
is found in God. Mm. God, uh, family is a, is a word that's rooted in God. God is Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In himself, God is a divine family, if you will. God relates to people as God is our Father. God is husband to his people. God is like a nurturing mother. Christ is the bridegroom of the church. And so the very definition, the very DNA, if you will, of family is God. And that's, that's sort of the plumb line. That's, that's the true mark that we're to take our direction from. In Psalm 68, 5 and 6, it says, A father to the fa fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. Divine appointment places people in families. Sometimes, you know, people say things like, if I were only in their family, or I was a mistake, or I don't even belong in my family. I wish I were born into that family. But viewed from a divine perspective, our placement in our human family is no accident. It's a divine appointment. God sets the solitary into families. He will personally intervene on behalf of widows and orphans who lose the normal protection of a husband and a father. In 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, it says to be alert and of sober mind that your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Folks, make no state mistake about it this morning. Satan is constantly looking for ways to attack your family. And scripture says, be sober, be vigilant, be on the lookout. We need help from God to live in these days as yeah. families. So how do we apply this? How do we bring it home to our own lives? How does this relate to me and my family? Well, I think it starts obviously with yourself. And I think that we have to look at our families as a gift from God. And we have to begin to thank God for the families that we have because that, the way that we see the other people in our family is, the, is directly, like it directly affects the way that we will treat them. And when you begin to see people as a gift from God and somebody that God has placed in your life, then you begin to see the value that they have and it helps to bring about reconciliation. It helps to, to bring down the stress level because you begin to think, oh, let me pour into their lives. Let me, let me try and enable and help and, and you know, lift them up rather yeah. than continue to tear them down. Um, the way that we view or treat our family needs to reflect the fact that yeah. God has given them to us. And I know, we all know that we have that crazy or annoying person in our family. If, if you, you th think about your family right now, if there's no one crazy or annoying in your family you can think of, it's you. It's you. <laughs> You're the one. And everybody else is thinking it about you. <laughs> And I know that those people are in our families, and I know that they're there, but when you begin to see them as somebody that God has placed in your life, when you begin to see them as an actual gift from God, then it begins to change, like I say, the way you interact with them and the way you deal with them. Um, and this applies not just to our physical family, but also to our spiritual family. Yeah. It's very easy to look around the church and say, that person is really annoying. Not pointing at anybody over here. <laughs> That's awkward. Uh, but it's. But we're family. <laughs> but we're family. But it's easy to judge those who are around us. But what we need to do from the scriptures, we need to look at those people and again see them as gifts from God. Yeah. And the line that Dave stole is in our videos. <laughs> we've recently we've started seeing videos that show life that's going on around the church, and then it ends with Gateway Church more than just an hour on Sunday. We're not here to be an hour on Sunday. We're not here to hear Tim's silly jokes. We're not, we're not here, wow. uh, you know, for the amen. I get an amen back there. That, changes, that? that changes everything. <laughs> but, but we're not here for, for what happens up here. We're here to be sure. a community and to be sure. a family. 
We're here to walk life together. Yeah. And that is what Gateway Church is all about. And that's why we're a part of yeah. this family. And we need to see, again, the people around us as actual gifts from God. Yeah. There's something powerful, you know, when, when there is unity in this, in this thing called family, in the body of Christ. There's something amazing that happens when we work, uh, as the scripture says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. And, uh, and that brings us to another thing that I think is helpful for us today, and that is uh, that God has a plan for you and for your family. Do you believe that God has a plan for you? Do you believe that God has a plan for Gateway Church as a spiritual family? Do you believe that he also has a plan for your family, as messed up as it can be? You see, regardless of what family situation you're in, you can walk according to God's plan for your family. Now, you can't decide that for your family members, but you can, as much as you possibly are able to, walk according to God's plan for your for family rather than just the societal trend. And you can even be the catalyst to make a difference in that situation. And that means not walking according to the world's plan for families. You see, if you look out in our society, you see that generally, even though they don't know it, the world's plan for families is disunity, disorientation, dishonor. And it's all about me. It also means not walking in the enemy's plan for families. It was already said this morning, but it's worth repeating. How many of you know that God is not the only one who has a plan for your family? Mm -hmm. Satan does too. He wants to, dis to steal, steal, kill, and destroy, and his plan for your family is disrepair, disintegration, destruction. And I want to encourage you to, re to, to stand against that and to walk instead in realigning your priorities so that what's important to God is important to us. God loves your family more than you do. Now, I know some of you are thinking that doesn't take a whole lot of love, you know, for God to love my family more than me. But, and some of us love our families like crazy. But God loves your family even more than you do. And this means you can believe for and walk in new patterns of health and wholeness and godliness and spirituality. God has a strategy for your family, and he has new patterns that he wants you to walk in today. I believe it's important in, in light of, of what we've heard this morning that we have, that we develop, that we adopt a specific strategy for the future yeah. for our families. What specific intentional strategies do you have to help your family in light of the society that we live in, in light of everything, the, the trends of what's around us? What strategies do you have specifically that will help your family be balanced and healthy and vibrant and full of hope for the future? Do you have a strategy? We certainly want to help you move forward from this morning. There are courses that we offer here at Gateway that are specifically offered not to keep people busy, not so that we have something to announce on Sundays, but they're there to meet the, the mandate that we feel as pastors to equip you to, to live life God's way. So whether it's love and respect, whether it's foundations or alpha or marriage live or cleansing stream, there are specific ingredients in those courses that will help you to have a strategy moving forward with your family, living life God's way. And so I want to encourage you, once a month we have a group that meet in the portable and it's a, a group of parents that we just want to pray for our families. Yeah. And, um, and so we meet once a month for an hour, 9.30 to 10.30, and, um, and we pray, we learn how to pray more effectively, we encourage one another, and, uh, and that's certainly available for you to come to. You know, it's, a, it's apparent from listening to what God has had to say, his two cents this morning, that God is interested in our future. Mm. That he desires to lead us as we're a part of families, our natural families, our spiritual families. He's asking for us to step up and, and to give our best to carry out what he has laid down as the, as the pattern, as what family should be. And, and he knows what will make it the healthiest and the most joyful part of our lives please know this this morning folks 
God wants to be a part of our families. He wants to help us, to equip us, to empower us, to make our families healthy and whole and, and, and full of joy and laughter. Yeah. Pastor Wayne read a verse from Joshua. Joshua was the, was the leader of the children of Israel and, and they were surrounded by pagan uh, people that, that were uh, filled with pagan worship, idol worship, and, and they were enemies of the children of Israel. And, and Joshua stands up before those that he was giving leadership to and he makes this declaration and he says, as for me and my family, even in light of everything that's going on around us, all the temptations, we're going to serve the Lord. We're gonna live our lives as a, as a family. We're gonna live it the way God has told us to live it. Amen. And I believe that this morning, what better time than on this family day weekend for us to stand together and to declare, you know, wherever you find yourself, whatever your family looks like, but today you can stand and, and say, God, as for me, as for my family, God, we're gonna serve you. From this day forward, Lord, may we have ears to hear what you wanna speak into our lives. Yeah, yeah. There are families here, guys, there are marriages that, that are so close to destruction. And the world says, just give up. The world says, just walk away. There are families where there's so much hurt. There's so many things that have happened, words that have been spoken and hollered and screamed. There's so much unforgiveness and hard hearts. And we see those things in our families and we say it's too late. But folks, we're here today to say, if you would simply stand, raise your hand and say, God, I need you in my family. Yeah. I need you in my marriage. Lord, help my heart to hope again. Help my heart to not be so hard and bitter. Lord. Wash away the poison. I know that there are enemies all around me. I, I hear them, I see them, I feel them. But God, my hope is in you. Yeah. And there is nothing too great for you. Our help comes from him today. Your help comes from him today. You and I can't do it alone. We need the help of the Spirit of God present in our lives and in our families and in our spiritual family. As you go today, you were reminded earlier in the service about a practical way that if you are here with a natural family, especially one with children, that you can partake and participate in something that uh, could help you to be an assistance to you to make the most of this Family Day weekend. So grab one of those packets on your way out have a look at it. Do it together as a family. There's different ones for different types of family. We do want to let you know that if, if we've had an overwhelming response and we run out, that's a good thing. But the items, the, 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 uh, the audio files and the things that are, that are there in that package are going to be available for you around 2 o'clock this afternoon for you to download on our website if, if we run out, okay? That's meant to be a practical help, but how many of you know what we need the most is the help of the Lord? in order to be who God's called us to be and be the families that we need. So Father, we just, we ask for your help today. Our eyes, we lift up to you because our help comes from you. Help us, Lord, to be the families you've called us to be. Help us, Lord, to be the people you've called us to be. Help us, Lord, to be a spiritual family, the body of Christ you've called us to be and to walk in your plan for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.